of all, I'd like to thank GFN for this opportunity for like gathering consumer voices together and um, having a chance to talk about all the misperceptions around tobacco harm reduction. Um, it's really um, uh, sad to see that there's a lot of misinformation going on. We work uh, when it comes to vaping advocacy and you can see how vaping is targeted by media and by different anti-vaping groups, uh, by uh, misleading information. And we also see that, for instance, highly uh, ranked institutions such as WHO, they also mislead public uh, on tobacco harm reduction they don't want to endorse or include harm reduction in the strategy for different countries. So media work, WHO, all of that combined, um, different countries just not wanting to uh, endorse harm reduction, all of that causes this confusion about what harm reduction is generally, not only vaping, but also other less harmful alternatives. So I think it's very important to um, have this sort of space where we can talk and we can debunk all those myths and we can communicate with consumers about that so that they stay well informed and they have a chance to actually listen to a scientific evidence. There are also, of course, many pillars why this misinformation is happening, but it uh, means that we as consumer organizations as, and, and, and as consumers, we should be more um, energized and active debunking those myths and talking about them openly. And what currently causes the most misunderstanding in the field of tobacco harm reduction? Well, I think that uh, as most understandings of this world, uh, this is call, uh, caused by a lack of knowledge uh, of uh, some people, so lack of education. Uh, and well, at some point also here, we do not have uh, at some point, I say, 100% proofs. Because we do know that uh, all the health reduction techniques, they're uh, in our hands, in labs, so the bench science, uh, they produce less harmful substances. Well, they, uh, tobacco smoke has around 7,000 harmful so uh, substances, and from one of the uh, replacement therapies, we have 20 or 50 uh, substances at reduced concentrations. But this is the uh, bench science. We need to prove it in a real life, so we need to be accepted uh, with the uh, ongoing prospective trials as uh, uh, every introduced drug or therapeutic uh, device being introduced to the market to show and to present that this uh, uh, harm reduction is a reality, not only chemical, but also physiological and medical reality. And then I think convincing those who, 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 who make the decisions about uh, introducing to the market, about uh, level of taxing, about uh, uh, preferences, uh, well, they will understand themselves without further uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, there's really probably three variables. The first is that the, the fact that big tobacco plays such a big role and that they, the big companies have now bought the companies like Swedish Match or they bought Jewel in the past or Enjoy, I think the suspiciousness of big tobacco and the reluctance to look at them as playing a much more complicated role now is a major factor, especially among younger people. I think that secondly, the funding of, that Michael Bloomberg and some others provide, um, I mean, I think he did a lot of good in his funding to try to reduce smoking, but his shift over the last five or six years, or whatever it is, to opposing tobacco harm reduction is, may well, in fact, probably will result in more lives lost than the lives that benefited from his previous campaigns against smoking. So that's really difficult. And thirdly, people find it difficult to separate tobacco and nicotine. I mean, it's remarkable that even physicians in my country and many others just can't understand that when you remove nicotine from tobacco, it so much dramatically reduces the, uh, the harms. So I think those are probably the three major variables. Thank you, Ethan. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you.